Hello and welcome to uh, the launch of the Quad Tech Network. This is a, um, a major initiative by the uh, National Security College at the Australian National University with uh, some key uh, partners across uh, the region, across uh, the world, uh, partners, of course, from the Quad countries, United States, Japan and India. Um, I want to begin by welcoming such a wide range of audience members and participants to today's event. Um, I would and will begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land uh, from which we're convening this, um, this conversation here in Canberra, in Australia, the, uh, the Ngunnawal people, and uh, to, to uh, pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. But of course, this is an international and global, and, and global event. I'll um, introduce myself and then turn to a few of our speakers, but I want to uh, particularly invite in a moment uh, the uh, Australia's ambassador for cyber security or cyber affairs and critical technology, Ambassador Toby Feakin, to say a few words. But before I do, I would just note that um, this event is on the public record. It's, it's by invitation, uh, but it is an open and public event. You're welcome to, uh, to quote anything said here. We strongly encourage you in particular to read the papers, spread the word, uh, contest the ideas uh, that our research partners are presenting here today. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave it there for the moment, just to uh, repeat again that as uh, I'm Rory Medcalf, head of the National Security College here at the Australian National University, and I welcome you all to this, uh, to this launch of the Quad Tech Network. It's my pleasure now to introduce Ambassador Toby Feakin, who is Australia's Ambassador for Cyber, uh, cyber Security and Critical Technologies. Uh, Toby, thank you. Thanks so much, Rory. And just before I begin, I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're virtually meeting on today, the Ngunnawal people, um, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And also want to acknowledge uh, and welcome any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending the event today. Um, as Rory said, I mean, it's been an absolute privilege and an honor for, and I can't believe I'm saying this, for the last four and a four years, two months to be firstly Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs, but now Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology. Um, and I don't think I could have ever envisaged the shift in terms of centrality of the issues that we began dealing with back in 2016, 17 around cybersecurity and broader uh, digital engagement uh, to the order of magnitude that we now find ourselves engaging and the requirement uh, for engagement on these issues. You know, there's no doubting that cyber and critical tech is, is absolutely central to geostrategic competition and broader foreign policy settings in a way that none of us could have predicted, but we are in that um, position now. Um, and I'm also really pleased to say that in that time as well, um, but that, that Australia has become a, a global part of the global leadership on um, cyber and critical technology issues. And we're always open-minded to working with a whole range of different partners, wherever they are, be they government, private sector, civil society, or academia. And I think it's in that vein that you know, really pleased to support the establishment of the Quad Tech Network today to promote track to research and public dialogue on these really important issues. Um, and, you know, through the QTN, we're very much hoping to see and invite challenge, fresh thinking, and that contest of ideas that's so important to innovating uh, our approach to these important issues. Um, and you know, the changes that we've seen since we originally produced a 2017 International Cyber Engagement Strategy are profound. Um, the advancement of technology obviously has long underpinned the big shifts that we see in the geostrategic environment, but it's the current pace of scientific and technology innovation, um, especially in the digital environment, um, that are really um, seeing great disruption um, in, in the global settings. Um, and critical technologies now are spreading across multiple different industries simultaneously and reshaping the way in which uh, work uh, is being conducted um, and the scale at which uh, we are now having to grapple with these issues is, is something that we could have never predicted. 
Um, and it's the totality of all of these innovations, which is really hard to gauge exactly. But we do know that it's going to fundamentally shape and shift the power dynamics of the 21st century. That much is certain. Um, we, as the Australian government, are seeking countries, uh, seeing countries working to advance their tech industries and capabilities. And, and it's, it's an obvious thing to say, but very important to say, some are like-minded and some are not. And there's growing recognition that the countries that lead in the innovation of new technologies will be able to define what is and what is not acceptable in those technology spaces. So the Australian government, along with its partners in the Quad and in other alliance arenas, is grappling with these new topics. Um, and we have to address these new technology issues to understand the benefits and the risks of a bifurcated tech sector and the importance of working collaboratively and transparently to preserve our values and our prosperity. And I think it's the liberal democratic values that underpin our societies that will continue to guide us. And those values are more important now than ever as we seek to oppose the application of technologies that endanger economic prosperity, human rights, threaten global peace and stability, and undermine democratic principles and processes across the world. We can't do this in isolation, and that's where initiatives like this are so vital to us in government, um, in, in seeking fresh thinking, new ideas. So it's through the QTN series, you know, we really welcome this timely research um, and recommendations through the institutes involved, um, even though we might not agree with all of them, it's that contestability of ideas that's vital for the policy space. Um, and we hope that in your work, you'll consider issues of national security and economic prosperity, but also of opportunity cost and the impacts on our own private sector and research communities um, and on our alliances, both the old alliances, but new and emerging ones too. And that these questions won't just focus on the immediate consequences, but the second, third order effects that continue to ripple across the geopolitical and economic and social canvas. And as I say, we may not agree with all of the analysis and recommendations in the paper, but we really do welcome your ideas and challenge for how together we might best navigate the risks and seize the opportunities that this enormous technological change brings. Um, as I say, the technologies the, and the geopolitics that surround them will continue to profoundly shape the power dynamics of the 21st century. So your thinking and creativity will be important in contributing to how government rises to and capitalizes on this challenge. And I just want to finish with a quote. Um, it's Albert Einstein, perhaps one of the greatest scientific minds we've ever known. And he said that imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. So I'm excited where your combined imaginations will take us and how the QTN evolves. And with that, I really welcome this launch and really look forward to the discussion. And thank you to all of the institutes involved for the hard work that they've put into this effort. Thank you, Rory. Look, thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, again, I'll, I'll echo the, um, the, the thanks of colleagues uh, for your and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs trade uh, sponsorship of this work, because as you say, this is very much a, a second track project. There is a healthy debate, a diversity of ideas in the papers that you're all about to read and the analyses and perspectives that we're about to discuss over the next hour. And that is of course a strength not only of uh, the, the quadrilateral dialogue and the individual countries in the quad, but really of the, uh, the rules and the principles that uh, so many of our countries and our societies stand for. Um, I'm just gonna offer a few more framing remarks, if I may, before I invite uh, the real stars of the show, and that is uh, a, a range of our leading researchers from the four countries who've produced the real content for this, um, this major track to research project. I guess I just wanted to recap uh, why, from my perspective, it makes sense that we're doing a quadrilateral project on cyber and critical technologies, a quad tech uh, dialogue, if you like, or a, or a quad tech research series. You know, why these countries and seemingly not others. I want to situate that in what's happening in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, to look a little bit at the, the geopolitical context of the conversation that we're about to have. Firstly, I'd, I'd note that the, the Quad, uh, Australia, India, Japan, the United States, certainly 
has in recent years surprised many observers with the way it has gone from strength to strength, certainly in security dialogue at the officials level, at the political level, at the leadership level, and even moved in other directions now, for example, with, with, with broad agreement on, um, on, on a wider agenda uh, that extends to some of the issues we're gonna talk about today. And of course, uh, has extended to the four countries working together in maritime security uh, in, in the defense exercise space. But many people will scratch their heads and say, why the quad on tech? And we'll come to that question in a moment. I think that uh, just as we've seen the new US administration, the Biden administration, in its very forward-leaning uh, foreign policy agenda in the first few weeks, really these opening weeks, we've seen the Biden administration reassert the importance of American engagement in the Indo-Pacific, reassert the importance of the Quad, but also assert the need for a really comprehensive strategy to ensure a stable balance in the region. I think that's part of the context where we have this conversation today. I don't think, uh, certainly speaking personally, but I suspect that for a lot of the organisations and researchers in the room, we're not necessarily seeing the Quad as some kind of exclusive arrangement on tech issues. It's a piece of the puzzle in new forms of international cooperation and collaboration to really set the rules, set the principles, set the understandings where we'll have sustainable development with uh, rapidly emerging critical technologies and a, um, a challenging balance of power in the region. Uh, a region where I think the diversity and the multipolarity uh, that the voices you'll hear today uh, is really a, a strength that will help us manage challenges into the, into the future. Uh, if we were to grapple with some of the research questions that I think are in the many preparatory conversations we had in this process that our researchers grappled with, a few things struck me. One was that question of, are we talking about the Quad exclusively or the Quad as really a core for much more uh, diverse and interesting ranges of partnerships in the multipolar Indo-Pacific? And I think, for example, the questions about Southeast Asia that, that uh, our Indian paper uh, on regional connectivity explore are important there. Are we looking to develop harmonised national positions and coordinated national positions, or are we in fact starting from a point of acknowledging difference and working with difference in our countries? Again, I think the, the work of our Australian colleagues uh, who you'll meet shortly uh, had a lot to say on that. Are we about analysis or action or both? I think the papers, uh, the research papers are a reference, a real bedrock now, I think of reference on all of the issues you're going to hear about today. But certainly in some cases, they've, they've pushed interesting boundaries uh, and really important boundaries with very firm recommendations, such as shared capability, such as intelligence sharing, uh, such as shared education and training and the like. And finally, what, what brings us all together in this diversity? I do think the fact that we're having this conversation and uh, one of the governments of the Quad countries was willing to sponsor uh, a project where the opinions are very much those of the authors themselves, points to the trust that is a fundamental feature of our societies and our political systems. Uh, the trust, which can certainly be frayed and challenged uh, politically, but nonetheless is there in the identity and values of our societies and systems, that, that principle of pursuing trust and understanding among the private sector with citizenry and with an inclusive and democratic political process, that I think is what really creates the opportunity for much greater collaboration among our countries in this space. Uh, and that of course gels, I think, with a multi-stakeholder approach to diplomacy on these issues. It's the start of a journey and I'm now going to invite uh, the first of our speakers or, or our researchers to offer their perspective. I might make a few concluding thoughts at the end if there's time. Um, I'm going to go in turn uh, and introduce first our, um, our American speakers, one of our Japanese uh, authors and our, um, our Indian author. And I, what I want to do uh, as I introduce you is just pose this question for the group. Uh, cyber and critical technologies, as we've noted, are, are increasingly headline issues for national leaders and foreign ministers uh, in forums in bilateral meetings and so on. And we're seeing uh, in the Indo-Pacific, whether it's the Quad or other arrangements, a whole lot of new groups, minilateral forums getting together, including among our countries to identify how do we meet the challenges uh, to regional 
stability and to a prosperous, secure, and sustainable future. That then raises the question of the Quad. What do you as our research partners see as the Quad's role being in cyber and critical technologies? Is it actually a bridge too far for us to be pushing, if you like, this idea of Quad tech cooperation? Or can you see, in fact, some kinds of natural evolutions uh, at work here. And I'm going to begin, if I may, with, um, with, Martin, uh, with Martin Rasser, who's from the Centre for a New American Security. Martin is Senior Fellow in Technology and National Security at CNAS and is uh, Principal Author of our um, American paper for the project. Martin, over to you. Well, thank you, Rory. Uh, let me begin by thanking you and the team at the National Security College for hosting this event. And it's great to be here with Ambassador Fikan and my uh, fellow panelists. Now, uh, specifically to your questions, uh, you know, I see tremendous opportunity for the Quad to drive meaningful change in the areas of cybersecurity and critical technologies. This grouping has a lot going for it, right? First and foremost, you have four tech-leading democracies that seek a free and open in the Pacific. Uh, they're increasingly aligned on the challenges posed by rising China. And the four countries also complement each other very well when it comes to technological capabilities, science and tech infrastructure, human capital. And I think that despite some different approaches to tech policy within each quad member country, there's now a view coalescing in each capital that greater collaboration is not only desirable, but also necessary. And using the quad as a starting point for such collaboration makes a lot of sense, right? You have a large portion of the world's GDP and population, shared interests and values, and a common understanding of what it will take to be economically competitive in coming decades. Now, to get to your other question, I very much see this as a natural evolution of the quad relationship, particularly when you consider how central technology is to the geo geostrategic competition that's taking place. Because of this, I see the right mix of a desire to act and numerous areas where the quad countries can do so. So in the near term, there's good opportunity to make important strides in areas, including setting norms that promote a free and open cyberspace, addressing supply chain vulnerabilities, such as for rare earths, and boosting technological innovation for 5G wireless infrastructure. So in short, I'm quite bullish on the Quad's ability to operationalize this part of the, uh, the broader relationship. And um, you know, this initiative is the first step uh, in a, a long journey where the four countries, as well as a broader set of allies and partners can make a tremendous difference uh, in, in this 21st century competition. So uh, thank you for, uh, for the chance to, to be here tonight. Thanks very much for that, Martin. And I might later on come back to you on some of the specifics of your recommendations for this operationalizing uh, the Quad in, in, in critical technologies. But first, I might go, in fact, to uh, one of our Japanese colleagues, and it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Narushige Michishita. Uh, Michi, uh, from the Graduate Research, the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in, um, in Tokyo and Japan. Uh, professor Michishita is Vice President and Professor there and of course grips his organisation as a very valued counterpart of the National Security College. So, so um, Michi, it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts at this stage on uh, whether in fact there is a quad agenda in this space or are we trying to push things too far? Right. Thank you very much, uh, Rory. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the successful launch of the Quad Tech uh, Network today. On behalf of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, we call it GRIPS, I would like to express our gratitude to the uh, Australian government and the National Security College uh, for inviting us to uh, this extremely important project. So the question that uh, Professor Medcalf gave me is uh, the Quad's role in the cyber and the critical technologies agenda. And uh, another question is, is this a bridge too far for a partnership that has traditionally been security focused or a natural evolution? 
So to this question or to these questions, I would say the bridge is not too far, but the quad partnership is not a natural evolution. What I mean is uh, we will be able to make it, uh, make it if we work hard, but we will not be able to get there unless we work very hard together. So we will definitely be able to work uh, much more closely together because, uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, cyberspace and uh, technology are borderless, right? And even when we do different things, we could still be working together. For example, in the physical world, uh, when we talk about maritime security in the Indo-Pacific, uh, India can take care of the Indian Ocean, while Japan and Australia uh, take care of the, uh, of the Pacific. The US is in both <laughs> oceans. Uh, you don't have to be doing the same thing neither do you have to be in the same place, right? So we can work together. However, both uh, cyberspace and technology are affected by politics. Unfortunately, some countries do not abide by rules and undermines the most efficient division of labor and supply chain. So we were in a way forced to bring geopolitics back in to the picture. So we are working hard to create not necessarily an ideal world, this is unfortunate, but a alternative, secure, cooperative, and sustainable free and open in the Pacific, four of us, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Michi. And again, I think um, that uh, uh, that, that, that quick opening will, will help us bring to a later part of the conversation where we can go to some of the specifics and the, the practicalities uh, and we'll speak to your, um, your colleague, Taka, Dr. Takahashi, in a moment. Uh, and first, uh, I'd like to introduce our Indian speaker uh, from the Observer Research uh, Foundation, uh, a lead Indian researcher, and that is uh, Trisha Ray. Uh, Trisha Ray is Associate Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, ORF, looking at technology and media. And uh, Trisha, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on our question. And perhaps also as we move along, uh, we might start to illuminate the, the question we all grappled with, which was how do we try to define critical technologies uh, for our purposes? But um, over to you, Trisha. Uh, so administrations in Australia, Japan, and many in the ASEAN member states are gradually embracing a more expansive conceptualization of the concept of the Indo-Pacific, which encapsulates issues beyond the traditional focus of maritime security and now includes development, connectivity, infrastructure, and more recently, cooperation on critical and emerging technologies with the Quad as the pillar or the enabler for the region. In the paper, we've made uh, 10 specific recommendations, which I'll be touching on later uh, during the course of this session. Um, the, these realities are captured in a core idea in the paper, which is the digital Indo-Pacific. The expanding ambit of the Indo-Pacific reflects the fact that the region is home to the most dynamic and rapidly growing digital economies in the world, and uh, that the region is simultaneously more focused on how best to build domestic capacity in tech uh, to be competitive on a global stage, but also maintaining relative autonomy in the midst of shifting political uh, geopolitical winds, especially when it comes to China or the US. These realities are unlikely to change. Um, right now, the big worry, especially amongst Indian analysts, is uh, regarding the incoming Biden administration's rather mixed signals, which have not provided a lot of reassurance on what the US's Indo-Pacific strategy is going to be, whether it will fall back on the traditional maritime security focus or not. Um, additionally, uh, over the past week, the administration and its officials hesitation to use the term Indo-Pacific, opting instead for Asia-Pacific 
uh, is also a worrying sign. Uh, and in the first call to action uh, to the Quad, uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, primarily cited FONOPS and maritime security aspects of the arrangement. That said, we are still in the first month of this new administration, so it might be premature to make these assumptions. And as uh, Rory mentioned in the beginning, we are more likely than not to see a more nuanced engagement by the US and the region under the current administration. Uh, the focus on say building capacity rather than relying solely on bans and trade wars is not a bad sign. Uh, again, uh, the national security advisor uh, did underscore the importance of emerging technologies, uh, working closely with allies and partners and making ambi uh, ambitious public investments to stay on the cutting edge. And there are several such areas that are ripe for investment. Uh, some cited in the paper are rare earths, which go into all our devices, computers, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, alternatives to untrusted 5G vendors, even basic infrastructure investment in fiberization of networks, all of these are, are ripe for investment. And so the Indo-Pacific construct has evolved. Uh, and now it's, it's imperative that all, all the actors involved commit much needed focus on these long-term tech and connectivity projects for the region and work in tandem with its regional partners. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tricia. And what we'll do before we go to, I've got some very specific questions for each of you on your research. Before we do, I'm going to uh, seek a, a somewhat different perspective from one of our Australian authors, and that's uh, Professor uh, Joe John Ford, uh, Joe Ford from the Australian National University. Uh, Professor Ford is Associate Dean International uh, and Professor at the Australian National University College of Law. And Joe, I, I'd be very interested in your thoughts, not so much on the opportunities for Quad cooperation, but what you see as some of the challenges going forward. We've already had a hint of, um, you know, the fact that there can be differences in perspective, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Metcalf Rory, and thank you to Ambassador Fikan and your team, and uh, regards to all our, our partners in the Quad Tech Network. So I'm happy to play a bit of a devil's advocate, as we've tried to do in our paper, um, in terms of some of the challenges to Quad cooperation in the area. And I'd, I suppose I've outlined three that run through the paper. The first, uh, and Rory, you have said this is only one piece, the Quad Tech Network, of, of a range of different activities. But the first deals with uh, the idea of like-mindedness and shared value that we've already heard today. And the danger that the rhetoric around that might obscure what we in the paper, and I'll keep plugging the paper, Rory, you'll be happy with that. What we in the paper talk about uh, as, as difference and the huge diversity that exists even within countries that we might label uh, liberal democracies, like-minded sharing values the huge difference in terms of legal systems that underpin the governance of responsible innovation, the governance of some of these technologies, critical technologies, and in the social cultural uh, context that underpins some of the values and precepts and principles that we talk about that underpin that value. So I think that's one challenge for the Quad uh, in the Quad Tech Network is the huge diversity in terms of some of these uh, the ways in which different cultural imaginations, for want of anything else, feed into fears of technology, ideas about technology, the parameters of technology and governance in society. The second challenge, I suppose, I would see uh, is not diversity so much and difference, but plurality. Uh, and that's a challenge to really, it's about the limits, as we talk about in the paper, of state-based or at least state-led uh, um, strategies uh, around the quad tech network in a field, and our paper deals with data-based critical technologies, especially AI, in a field in which the private sector and big tech firms in particular play such an outsized or disproportionate role um, in shaping the, the whole narrative around these technologies and their good or otherwise, and the, shaping the possibilities of governance models around these technologies. So that's the second challenge, is the plurality of actors and the limits to what state-led or state-based 
diplomacy can do uh, in that kind of uh, in, in the context of that private sector relationship. And the third challenge, I suppose, is around inclusivity. I don't think this challenge, we don't think this challenge is unique to the Quad, but it's a challenge around inclusivity of policymaking. So we've talked a lot already today about the concept of trust, but one of the challenges in relation to ideas of cooperation on shared ideas of how to govern responsible innovation, responsible critical technologies, is how do you bring along your societies with you and include them in the conversations about the possibilities and the problems of governance uh, and include them in, in that process so as to build trust, not just in the technologies, but in the frameworks for governing those technologies. So I think those are three challenges that we try to, to, to put forward in order to, as Ambassador Fekin said, promote a bit more contestation of ideas around the possibilities and the limits of the Quad Tech Network. Thank you. Uh, thanks indeed for that, Professor Ford. We are, I think, within this network, we are being our own, our own critics. It's kind of the um, we, we have a full conversation. It's the the Quad uh, Clubhouse, I guess. With the Quad values, yes. you could say. Look, I'm going to go to some specifics now in the um, the short time that we've got left, and I want to uh, really get back to our Japanese colleagues to begin with because we we divided the four big research papers, and they're all available now on the National Security College website. So please take a look at them. We divided the research papers into themes and our Japanese colleagues were asked to focus on really the, 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 the hard, well, the hard and the other forms of national security, the, the, the national security policy settings for uh, cyber and critical tech. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Takahashi, Dr. Kohei Takahashi, who's a colleague of Michishita-san, a researcher at, uh, at GRIPS. Uh, Dr. Ta Takahashi, can you please give us uh, a few thoughts on what your research uncovered regarding opportunities for Japan and others to bolster cooperation uh, in, in the national security dimension of cyber and critical tech. Thank sure. you. Sure. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, we have a five specific recommendations on cyber security. Uh, first, sharing cyber threat intelligence. Sharing cyber threat intelligence is important because you know, it enables us to identify common threats that we face, and it makes it possible for quad countries to work more closely together. Actually, Australia and the United States are already working on the cyber threat intelligence in the Five Eyes framework. So it is important for the quad countries to establish a new framework for sharing information on cyber threat effectively. Second, establishing a fact-checking monitoring system. Influence operation in cyberspace using fake news, for example, have become a big issue. It is important for the Quad countries to establish a fact-checking system. Third, promoting collaborating research on using AI. AI will be used in cyberspace in the future it will be the necessary for us to promote research and study in this field to enhance our interoperability capabilities. Fourth, promoting joint exercise. Each country has its own strengths and weaknesses. It is important to conduct joint exercise in order to learn the strengths of the other potential allies and partners and to improve their resilience. Joint exercise will also offer great opportunity to learn from each other. Last, promoting human research education. We should promote personal exchange among quad countries. We will have to depend on online education programs as long as the COVID environment continues. We believe that the Quad Tech Network has a huge potential to achieve these recommendations in the field of the cybersecurity. We will look forward to working with all of you guys. All of you, again, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Takahashi-san. That's a very crisp, uh, clear set of five recommendations, and they all have in common that theme of the, the complementarity of our four countries and how we can help one another. I'm going to go now back to uh, Tricia Ray. Um, so, Tricia, you and your co-authors 
presented an overview of connectivity and resilience across the Indo-Pacific, a digital Indo-Pacific, and it went, of course, more broadly than the four quad countries. But you also do move from analysis to action. Can you please share uh, your top insights? Uh, let's say your top three insights from your report, please. Sure. So our uh, paper makes recommendations under three broad themes. The first is uh, the need for trusted and resilient supply chains. And in our conceptualization, uh, this includes not just the components that go into our devices, but also say diversifying through capacity building within countries for manufacture and uh, seeking new partners to help ease choke points in technology trade for, uh, flows. Uh, it also encapsulates the underexplored aspects of uh, data flows and the security of data flows. The second major theme is modifying existing partnerships of which the Quad is one to adapt to a changing geopolitical context. And uh, so the resurgence of the Quad, the emergence of the digital Indo-Pacific is one such repurposing of existing partnerships. The third major theme is um, the need for new coalitions uh, with like-minded actors. These can be more area or issue specific. Uh, an example is the proposed D10 Club of Democ uh, Democracies on 5G, just like issue specific uh, goal oriented um, coalitions. Uh, the paper contains 10 specific recommendations that serve as actionable starting points, but I'll just highlight like a three or four. Um, the first I'd like to highlight is that uh, the implications of the numerous data governance frameworks that are emerging in the region on the dig uh, digital economies of the region have not fully been explored. And so we recommend the establishment of data governance track 1.5. So the quad can be the starting point and then we gradually integrate more economies and countries in the region. Um, we also focus a lot on first order connectivity issues, including just basic electricity, access to reliable high-speed internet, digital literacy, all of these are important elements. Um, and then another major recommendation is in technology manufacturing. Uh, most of the region, Southeast Asia, India especially, are major assembly hubs in global technology trade, but there needs to be more focus on uh, core competencies and capacity building. We give the example of semiconductors in the paper where there are a lot of pure play foundries in the region which assemble but don't design. But most of the value for semiconductors lies in the design, which is why Intel accounts for a quarter of global semiconductor value. And then the last recommendation I'll go into relates to the digital economy, which is that we need common standards for digital services. A starting point that we've mentioned is uh, digital payments, harmonizing national and then regional standards for digital payments. Thank you. Thanks for those uh, recommendations. It's it's the the tip of the of the iceberg. So, thank you. I'm going to go to um, back to our American colleague to Martin uh, Rassa. And Martin, um, your paper introduces a concept. I think you term it techno democratic statecraft. Uh, as a way for like-minded countries to manage the international peace and security implications of critical technologies. Love to hear a bit more about uh, techno-democratic statecraft and what it actually means operationalised. What are some of the recommendations? If you also get a moment just to touch on whether you think um, the Biden administration is going to uh, really lean forward into the region on these issues, that would be useful to hear, noting, of course, that um, several of your distinguished colleagues from CNAS have just gone into the administration. So I'm hoping things are in uh, good hands there, but over to you, please, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. So what I wanted to lay out with this concept of techno-democratic statecraft is a, a, you know, really an affirmative framework for how to think about approaching tech policy. The overarching goal is to take concrete action to shape your technological futures such that it is a, a positive and beneficial one. 
So I see this agenda as having seven distinct but connected qualities. So first, the approach is proactive, right? So this means that a country's leaders should determine what technology areas are of priority based on their national needs and goals, rather than trying to stay ahead of or chase the efforts of competitors. The second is being all inclusive. This means maximizing the range of key inputs, such as R&D investments, human capital, education, tax policy, to name just a few. So policymakers really need to treat technology areas as part of a large interrelated web rather than stovepiped and independent disciplines. Third is that this is a whole of society effort. Government has a role to play in supporting and guiding technological developments. The hands-off approach toward industry of the past few decades isn't going to work to address the biggest problems that we face when it comes to technology. Uh, fourth, flexibility. So there has to be an adjustable balance between affirmative measures to boost competitiveness and protective actions such as export controls to safeguard certain uh, advantages. Fifth is being values driven. Tech policy decisions ultimately need to be in line with liberal democratic values. Um, that I think this is a theme that keeps coming up for the Quad, it's particularly important that that be uh, the cornerstone of our actions. Sixth, multilateralism. The underlying premise here is that no one country can tackle most tech policy challenges on its own and expect to be successful. And that's why I'm personally so enthusiastic about this quad tech network concept and the broader tech alliance type of work that I've been doing the past few years. Um, I see this as being really the best way forward. And finally, in order to do all this, you do need a healthy dose of pragmatism, right? So we should be open and welcome to cooperation with non-democracies where our values and interests sufficiently align. And I think you know, working with China on climate change would be a prime example of this. Now, to operationalize this, I would recommend that each quad country craft a true national strategy for technology. And, and by this, I mean, you know, how a country plans, executes, and updates its technology policies. And this requires a vision. So where, where do you want to be 20, 30, 40 years down the road? And what tech areas do you want your country to be the world leader? Where should you, you be globally competitive? And, and where are the areas where you can afford to be a fast follower? Because you're not going to be number one in everything. It's just not uh, affordable, it's not achievable, ultimately. Um, the ultimate goal of this strategy should be for a country to empower its citizens, compete economically, and secure your national interests without having to compromise your values or your sovereignty. So what I ultimately wanted to do with uh, laying out this, this framework was to, to help guide decision makers on how to turn strategy into action in an effective manner. Now, to your question on um, what I see the Biden administration doing, some very encouraging signs um, in terms of the people that they're bringing on board and how the Biden administration is starting to structure itself when it comes to uh, tech policy matters. Uh, the National Security Council now has a tech directorate. Um, the uh, director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy is now a cabinet level official. So just those two moves right there are very encouraging. Um, then you have the fact that uh, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, are very much talking about uh, the concept of techno democracies and techno uh, authoritarian regimes, the need for greater uh, multilateral collaboration our European allies, they proposed a trade and technology council. Obviously we have the Quad Tech Network Initiative, and then there's numerous uh, other bilateral and plurilateral ideas that are percolating in, in all the relevant capitals in the world, where I really think in 2021, 2022, we're going to see significant movement toward um, greater collaborative efforts on very, critical issues. You know, uh, we've already talked about a lot of them, right? Supply chains, 5G, um, there's issues with artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. 
the list goes on and on, but there's a lot of common ground and I think a lot of interest to act. So I'm personally very optimistic that we'll see some meaningful change in the very near future. Thanks for, thanks for all of that, uh, Martin. And we'll all be watching, watching very closely with a very keen interest. And I note uh, for those listening, as you go to read the papers, I certainly recommend that you take a close look at the recommendations in the various papers, some of which uh, do push the boundaries of ambition. I note uh, that, Martin, you explore the idea of what a multilateral cyber early warning system would look like for quad countries or for more, but many of which also really are about building the complementarities that we already have in place. Look, we're going to wrap up in about 10 or 12 minutes, but before we do, I want to put one last question to all of our research partners. And that really goes a little bit to the what next. It, it explores this question of what value there is in not only a track two initiative like this, but this kind of informal initiative uh, that engages different stakeholders, that engages independent voices in uh, advising, suggesting, and even shaping policy. Because on the, the critical tech agenda, as we've explored, uh, you know, society and the citizenry are absolutely vital. Uh, certainly in democratic contexts, their views will, will count. Uh, and certainly what, what, what they're willing to tolerate and what their culture and values will shape uh, is, is crucial. The private sector, uh, whether for good or not always so good, is um, absolutely uh, key. And the right motivations and incentive structure to engage uh, the interests of the private sector on these issues is vital. And of course, there is government. And I think in this case, government playing such a key facilitation role. We talk about track two diplomacy a lot in universities and think tanks and a lot of our engagement. And of course, we often mean that that in a sense is a, a license for academics and analysts and those who perhaps don't have policy responsibility to um, very candidly share our views either with one another or with the public forum. But track two diplomacy may be a different thing when it comes to the critical tech agenda. Uh, and so I'm wondering if each of our uh, participants can just offer us a minute or two of thoughts on what you see really as the role for track two here going forward, whether it's in the QTN or whether it's in another format. And I'm actually going to introduce at this point, Catherine Manstead, uh, one of my colleagues from the National Security College, because Catherine as our senior advisor for public policy was and is the editor of the QTN research series and uh, I think much of the, uh, the kudos that we've heard today really goes to her. But Catherine, what are your, your views on the potential for track two, please? Thanks, Rory. Look, I've got two observations I'd like to make. The first is particularly in the space of um, the quad and technology cooperation. I think it's no secret that the quad has faced at times a perception management problems and can be perceived as an organ of geopolitical jostling. I think by taking and adding to what the Quad is doing in tech, this track two layer, that proves some of those perceptions to be misperceptions because the track two space is ultimately about a level of inclusivity. It's ultimately about contestability. And it's also recognizing some of the realities that um, my colleague, um, Professor Ford was talking about, um, that tech is inherently multi-use, it's inherently pluralistic, um, and you can't have power, you can't exercise deterrence, even you can't build resilience, which is the theme of the Indian paper, unless you have um, diverse stakeholders on board. And so I think track two um, both has a, I guess, a, a, it's a showcase of principles, but also is the reality that we need to manoeuvre in this space in a much more dynamic way. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that in this space, track two um, debate is essential because it is so fast moving and it is so uncertain. And all of us, and I think you get this impression when you read the four papers, are building the plane as we're flying it. And two ways in which we can really learn from each other, I think, is you get the sense again from, from reading the four papers that all countries are grappling with how to translate foreign policy and diplomatic action into domestic policy as well. How do we set up our bureaucratic structures? How do we strategize and set objectives? All of us are, are doing that um, as we go and, and we can absolutely learn from each other. 
not to mention obviously learning from the ways in which the technologies are deployed throughout society and some of the, the, the pilots that we see each country having different strengths in. Um, and just on that, and this is the last point, I think track two is also about showing what's possible. And the Quad can really be a beacon for other unilateral, bilateral um, and regional groupings to, to, to look to in as much as this is about being a little bit creative. It is about pushing the boundaries of what's possible um, and sometimes contesting commercial interests and, um, and government policy in our own countries or elsewhere. And just looking across the, the papers, I think one of the main areas we'll see that playing out is how each of the countries are resolving some of the really tricky trade-offs in this space. So trade-offs between security and privacy, between security and prosperity, trade-offs between commercial interests and the collective good, and trade-offs between public uses, as in government uses of technology, and private um, uses of technology for uh, social benefit services and the public good. Again, we're all flying that, flying that plane, building it simultaneously, and by looking to each other, being a bit creative, being edgy, as I think all of these papers are to some extent edgy in what they propose, um, that is the, that's the real uh, value out of track two. And QTN obviously is just one part of a trend we're seeing in this space, particularly across the region of embracing that power. Thanks very much for that, uh, Catherine. I'm, I'm now gonna go to our Japanese colleagues again, back to Professor Michishita and Dr. Takahashi, if you've got a minute or two of um, remarks on the potential for, for track two, maybe including the role of, uh, of industry. Okay, um, so we ask ourselves, uh, what are the low hanging fruits? Uh, I think the report that we did and the uh, meeting that we are having today are the fruits that we have already produced. <laughs> um, so we are eating those fruits that today, which, which are tasty. Uh, that said, let me identify one immediate action that we can take and uh, one uh, long-term goal that we must pursue. The immediate action that we can take is to identify common challenges that we face. So actually, I think our report help us, reports uh, help us do that. Um, the Australian team identified the importance of uh, eth uh, ethics in approaching questions of the responsible development and uh, use of uh, critical technologies. Uh, the Indian team uh, discussed supply chains and adoption of uh, digital eco economy and digital transformation. It also uh, discussed establishing necessary regimes. The Japanese team talked about legal issues related to cybersecurity and critical technology. And finally, the US team suggested that the, uh, suggested the importance to bolster cybersecurity and uh, supply chain, uh, uh, secure supply chains. So we have some common themes and already know some of the areas in which we can start working together. Uh, in terms of a long-term goal, which is more challenging, I think our long-term goal uh, is to create a secure, cooperative, and sustainable free and open Indo-Pacific. And this is not only for the Quad partners, but also for other countries in the region. So when the Quad countries work together, we should make sure that this partnership will eventually be expanded to the entire uh, region, which is challenging, but uh, worth trying. Thank you. Thank you, Michi. Um, Ambassador Fikan, I might just go a few minutes over time if it's okay with you. We'll go a few minutes past uh, the uh, official conclusion of this because I want to harvest a few more thoughts if, if, if you can stick around. Uh, so I'm, I was going to ask uh, Takahashi-san, did you have any additional observation on the value of track two? Uh, not really, thank you. Um, look, thank you again for your um, for your recommendations earlier. We look forward to digesting the full report. So I'll just go then briefly to um, to uh, Ms. Ray, to Tricia Ray. Any uh, thoughts from you? I know you talked earlier about track two, but where would you like things to go next? 
so um the role of track to forums like this many of many of the uh, important factors we've already kind of demonstrated in the course of this webinar, which is, for example, floating new ideas, um, the approaches adopted by all the papers are fairly distinct and it's always interesting to read how domestic political, social and economic priorities are reflected in the quad policymaking framework. Um, it's also useful in helping define new trends, especially in a space as fast moving and rapidly changing as emerging technologies. And so also, it also helps us understand both shared challenges amongst the court partners and the region broadly, but also in um, flagging key areas of difference, um, of which there are many. And but while we are united by shared democratic principles, our democracies are very different as many of the speakers have highlighted. And so, yes, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how these diff differing framing, differing ideas come across in our papers. And certainly uh, track to forums like this are a useful way in progressing dialogue in the court. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tricia. And I'm going to ask uh, Martin Rasser to have the last word from the panel. And Martin, again, it would be useful to know if you see Track 2 as a way of engaging industry or if there are other avenues for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say just in general that Track 2 initiatives, you know, really have the most impact in working through the nuts and bolts issues of how you put, in this case, effective multilateral tech policy into action. And so obviously, understanding geopolitical trends and context is important and necessary, but ultimately, you need a, a roadmap for action. And I think in particular for the Quad Tech Network, that would include uh, answering questions like what the uh, appropriate organizational bureaucratic approaches should be toward decision making, a meeting structure and frequency, to your point, how government officials should engage with stakeholders from industry and civil society. And you need to identify areas for cooperation, highlighting opportunities, and making recommendations on how to overcome hurdles. So the closer a track to effort can come to crafting a, a real blueprint that policymakers can fine tune and begin to execute, uh, the better the odds for success. But then at the same time, the long term challenge then is, of course, you need policymaker buy in, right? You need a champion uh, to push the agenda forward. And that's hard enough to do in, in a single government. In this case, we're looking at four you know, pretty different governments where you need that momentum going. And I think that's ultimately going to be one of the, the biggest challenges is to sustain uh, that, that enthusiasm to push what is a very ambitious and complex concept to move that forward in a way that it becomes meaningful and impactful. So thank you very much for, uh, for the last word there. Thank you indeed, Martin. And I'm actually going to hand the real last word to, I think when we heard we heard about policy makers and, and uh, champions, I'm going to hand the last word to uh, Ambassador Feekin. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Um, and thank you to all of the uh, uh, speakers today and all of the institutes that have been involved. I mean, may, maybe I can just add a few words on that last question you were asking everyone. Um, you know, let me start from the basis of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in always listen. You never know if you listen hard, you might actually learn something and, and be prepared to have your mind changed. And I think it's from that kind of sense of openness that we have to take on these kinds of joint shared cyber and technology challenges um, and opportunities. So, you know, the power of effective track to diplomacy of conversations of research is that, you know, you can have your mind changed or influenced wherever you may be in government. And certainly something I take already from today is listening to the practical nature of what you've been suggesting. You know, everyone should go and read all these papers. There's a lot of good intellectual rigor in them, lots of good information to digest. And at its heart, it's taking that, extracting it and giving some practical suggestions to government. Some of those have sparked me in the sense of, I think we're doing a few things around some of those recommendations, but already, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, there's some really interesting concepts and ideas there to talk to friends and colleagues about 
um, in terms of how we expand our policy horizons. I think, you know, for we in, inside policymaking, um, and if I may, you know, my background for the last 20 plus years now, and it's frightening to say that, has been in tech policy. Um, and if there's one kind of word of advice I give myself and anyone dealing with tech, it's go into this with, tr with the idea of trying to enable flexibility in your policy settings. And with that, then you will be able to approach new innovative technologies um, in, in, the, um, right, in the right way. So, you know, that's certainly something that I've taken from today. Um, normalizing conversations like this um, are vitally important and continuing to um, show that technology and cyber issues and alliance discussions around those are, are core fodder um, for public discourse um, and for, for projects like this. You know, I've, I've had, um, uh, it's been incredibly invigorating the discussion today and any conversations that we've had in the lead up to this. Um, and as I say, I think from my perspective, from um, the, the Australian government's perspective, very exciting um, to not only digest what you've written now, but to see where you take this initiative and the kinds of recommendations it gives us because as this context that we're in right now, it's vital that we have as much useful intellectual fodder out there as possible. So thank you very much everyone for everything that you've put into this. Um, know that they will all be, all the papers will be digested um, in detail inside uh, various governments. So thank you very much. And, and that brings our proceedings to a close. Thank you indeed, Ambassador. Thank you to all participants. The, uh, the National Security College here at the Australian National University really is an institution that's all about building national capability, in this case, uh, working with partners to help build our capability together as well. And so it's a real honour and privilege for us to say that the, the QTN is officially launched. Go read the papers, challenge our ideas. We look forward to the continuing public and policy debate uh, and stay well, uh, friends from across the region, from all the time zones uh, from which you've joined this discussion today. Thank you again and goodbye.